Okay, so as you guys can see behind me, we have uh, war dates. And what I'm doing here, guys, is uh, can anybody tell me what year Abraham Lincoln was elected president? It's off the top of your head. I mean, everybody should know that, what year he was elected president. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do you know when the Civil War was? What year did it start? Roughly. Eighteen what? Sixty one. Eighteen sixty one. Yeah. So if you know that the Civil War started in eighteen sixty one, then you have a pretty good idea of when Lincoln was elected, right? Yeah, 1860, because presidents are elected on even numbered years, right? Every four years. Yes? Okay. So that's what we're doing here. We're going to try and get you into kind of a chronological understanding of American history. And I think doing it this way is a little bit easier than, say, memorizing all 45 presidents and the dates they went were in office, right? You don't want to do that, do you? I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to make you do something I didn't want to do. But we're going to do this. Because I want to do this. Okay? So does anybody know what year the American Revolution started? 1775. April 19th to be specific. Okay? Oops. And it lasts until 1783. Now can you guys at home see that? Not that you can even hear me, because it's not working. I don't think you can see that. I can see that right there. Okay. This is on your, uh, this is on the module on Canvas. Did any of you guys look at that? Okay. Did any of you guys get notifications this morning about the meeting? Yes. Okay. You should, it should it will be an outlook. In your email okay and if you go into canvas and um, if you go into three office 365 in canvas you'll have to log in and that's going to connect your Canvas to your Office 365. So you may even get a notification in Canvas for the meeting. Okay? For some reason, the dang meeting's not working. So I'm going to post this video when we're done. Uh, hopefully, I'll have it figured out by the time you guys need to watch it tomorrow. Okay? So you can come in at 12.50 tomorrow at home and watch this live. I'll be finishing this. Okay, because we won't get through it all today. Now, George Washington, right? The American Revolution shot her around the war, war, world. So, uh, can you name any major battles from the American Revolution? You remember any major battles? Yeah, that was the first one. Yorktown. Yorktown was the last one. There was a big one in the middle up in New York that was a turning point. Saratoga. Saratoga. Okay where we kicked Burgoyne's butt up there, okay, and surprised him, and he was lazy, and yeah. George Washington started with an army of 20,000, but before long, those people had to go home and harvest the crops. So they were like, his army like shrunk, and then it got hit by smallpox. He went up to New York to take on, you know, the, the, the British up there, because they had kicked him out of Boston. Remember, if you heard about General Knox, General Knox went up into Fort Ticonderoga in Canada and stole all the British cannons and then hauled them across the mountains down to Boston. And under the cover of darkness, the whole city of Boston was surrounded by American cannon. And the British went scurrying like flies. Okay, because they were surrounded. They went to New York. Washington went up there. And instead of getting his butt kicked, 
he turned tail and ran. Because Washington said, never give up the army. Never put yourself in a situation where you're, you're going to lose your army. And so he kept holding on. In 76, in the winter of 76, they were down in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. That's where Thomas Paine's The Crisis was read to the men. These are the times that try men's souls. And they crossed the Delaware on Christmas Day, right? In freezing cold sleep. I mean, it was awful. And surprised the British at Trent, his first victory. A couple days later at Princeton. There were a lot more defeats than victories. But we got the last one in Yorktown. George Washington. Okay? The American Revolution is incredible to study. Now, can any of you guys trace your families back? They call it like sons and daughters of the American Revolution, where somebody in your family fought in the American Revolution. Now, a lot of the white folks in here come from German ancestry because a lot of Germans settled out here. So th that immigration probably came much later, or Irish. Yeah. So the immigration was probably a lot later. Okay. I had a Philip Ebright that came to the New World in the 1740s from Switzerland. Okay. And his son fought in the American Revolution. Lancaster, Pennsylvania, that's where they first settled. The Ebrights. Okay. So I am a son of the American Revolution. Pretty cool. All right. Um, then who are we fighting? Of course, the British, right? Who are we going to fight here in the War of 1812? The British, okay? And this dealt with, you know, some disputed areas like uh, New Orleans, that whole area along the Gulf Coast down there, and then up in Canada. There was a lot of disputed territory. What famously comes out of this, Madison was president, um, and the British reached Washington, D.C., didn't they? And they actually scorched the White House. Now, they didn't burn it down. And Dolly Madison famously did what? The portrait of George Washington. Okay. And um, so they had to paint the house later. Probably the biggest and come, kind of most celebrated battle of this war was the Battle of New Orleans. Or you should say, New Orleans. Okay. And... Andrew Jackson was the hero of the Battle of New Orleans, which actually took place after the peace treaty was signed. Right? Now, I have an ancestor on my mother's side that fought in this war. Okay? My mother's maiden name is Perry. And you may have heard the name, I don't know if Mr. Ferris or the other teachers taught you this, a guy named Oliver Hazard Perry, who fought against the British in the Battle of Lake Erie in, World, er, in uh, War of 1812. And he said these famous words, we have met our enemy, and they are ours. That's my ancestor. And then his brother is Commodore Matthew Perry, who uh, opened up trade in the Far East. Remember that guy? Eh, you should. Okay. Now, I teach a class called War and Peace, which they haven't given me in the last two years. I don't know why. But I have my students do projects, and, you know, on, on these wars and uh, had some students do it looking into the Perry brothers and they found out that he's a, the William, uh, Oliver and Matthew Perry are descendants of one William Wallace making me a descendant of one William Wallace now not everybody knows who that is you're shaking your head anybody else know William Wallace have you ever seen the movie Braveheart. Not Mel Gibson. He plays William Wallace. He's a Scot, okay? And um, so my mom's family comes from Scotland. And he fought against the British and they made a famous movie, which is fantastic. Braveheart, okay? It's gory, but it's really good. Isn't it? Yeah, check it out. Okay. I will mention. During this history class, people, this is a list of all the movies that I will mention during my lectures. I'm a movie buff. Okay, so I'm going to be giving you lots of good
titles to enjoy, okay, over time, starting with grade one, okay. All right, three-year war, 1812, okay, moving up, and that's kind of a draw, the War of 1812 is kind of a draw. It's like, uh, you can kind of say the same thing about the Korean War later on. Uh, things kind of went back the way they were at the beginning. Okay. Uh, the Mexican War. This is one of the lesser studied wars that we have. Uh, 1846 to 48. Okay. Now this deals with that whole thing, um, manifest destiny. You remember that? You know, from sea to shining sea, and the Mexicans were in the way of that. So first you had the Louisiana Purchase, right? Great deal. I mean, that was a phenomenal deal. So was Seward's folly when we bought Alaska. We bought Alaska for seven point two million dollars. Good deal. And uh, so what's going to happen, most of this war is going to be fought actually in Mexico, in places like Veracruz and Mexico City, okay? And when this is said and done, uh, the United States will expand to places like that are modern day, uh, New Mexico, California, right, Arizona, uh, that will all fall into manifest destiny, okay? And then Texas gets its act together and says, all right, we're going to be with you guys, okay? So uh, that's the Mexican War, okay? Uh, you got people like James Polk. Uh, this is around the time of the Alamo and all that, right? And then the, the American Civil War, which we talked about earlier, 1861 to 1865. To this day, guys, continues to be the bloodiest war in American history. State against state, house divided, family versus family, brother versus brother. Now guys, from the very beginning of our republic, there's always been this battle between whether states get to make decisions or the national government, local governments, that tug of war between the states and the national government. And obviously the underlying issue with the states' rights or federalism was slavery. And so President Lincoln's uh, main goal was to unify the union, you know, to, to keep the union. And in doing that, we would abolish slavery, okay? Um, this lasts four years, way longer than anybody thought it would. Um, and the South fought a defensive war. And for, them, for the North, that meant a lot of casualties. And for the South, it meant a lot of casualties. Um, you guys probably did a pretty good study on that last year, the Civil War, okay? And then the Spanish-American War. Now this is getting closer to the end of school for you guys last year. Not sure if you even talked about it. It's hard to talk with that crap on your face. Okay, this has a nickname called the Splendid Little War. All right, let's see if you remember some of this. Does anybody know where the Spanish-American War was fought? Where did the fighting take place? In Spain? Come on. Over here. In Spain? Anybody remember this? Cuba, Cuba, Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riders up San Juan Hill, which is actually Kettle Hill. No, ring a bell. Isn't that like the Panama Canal and stuff like that? As a, a, a 
la around that time period. Um, how about, remember the Maine? The USS Maine was in Havana Harbor, and it blew up, and everybody blamed the Spanish. It was yellow journalism. Remember the, uh, the newspaper people that wanted uh, for us to go to war? Okay? So it was like, it was this whole mass thing, let's go to war. And Teddy Roosevelt was the Secretary of the Navy. He resigned his position so he could go into battle. He could actually fight. He was the head of the cavalry. Now, when they went up San Juan or Kettle Hill, okay, they were dismounted cavalry. It was too steep. You can't take the horses up there. Okay, so dismounted cavalry, he led troops there. Uh, now, this is in Cuba. See, the Cubans got tired of the Spanish. And we got tired of the Spanish. We wanted to trade with Cuba instead of the Spanish having control. So we helped the Cubans get rid of the Spanish. Does that make sense? And then we wanted control. <laughs> and the Cubans didn't want that. So we didn't take control of Cuba. We actually didn't, unlike Puerto Rico, which we got at the same time. So Puerto Rico becomes part of a US territory during the Spanish-American War. We took that from the Spanish. Any you guys ever been to Puerto Rico? It's pretty cool. Uh, we went, we took a cruise out of Puerto Rico, so we flew into San Juan. It's a beautiful city. Vibrant colors, the coastline. They have old forts there from this time period that you can go check out and stuff. It's really neat. Puerto Rico's pretty neat. Okay, and you don't even need a passport because it's US territory, okay? The other place where this was fought, guys, very importantly, is out here in the Philippines. See, the Filipino people wanted to get rid of the Spanish too. They said, well, we'll help you with that too, okay? And we get some very famous, uh, uh, you know, heroes out of this, like uh, Admiral Dewey and Admiral Arthur MacArthur will be a hero of the Spanish-American War in the Philippines. And he will have a son that will be born in the Philippines and grow up in the Philippines on American air, uh, base because the Philippines becomes an American territory. We do take over where the Spanish leave. Okay? And that Douglas MacArthur, the son, will go on to be a famous World War II general, like General Pat, General Douglas MacArthur, the son of the war hero, Arthur MacArthur, okay? So the Philippines is gonna be an American territory from 1903, okay, this, uh, yeah, around 1903. We had to fight the Philippines, it wasn't easy taking control of the Philippines, okay? And we held that territory until 1946, we gave the Philippines back. They are now sovereign, okay? Puerto Rico, we haven't given back. Or the American Samoa or the U.S. Virgin Islands. What's the other one? Puerto Rico, U.S. Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Guam. Guam, okay? You can go all those places without a passport, okay? I like to travel. Okay, explain a little war in 1899, okay? So that, uh, that happened, okay? That, guys, is a war of imperialism. Wouldn't you say, you guys know what imperialism is? Like where you conquer other people and take over, right? Spanish-American War was imperialism, for sure, okay? A lot of people like to, you know, attack the United States as an imperialist nation, okay? It's, it's questionable. Now, do we impose our will on people? Yes, of course, okay? Uh, okay, World War I. Anybody know what year that started? 19, say? 
14. And it lasted till 18. What year did the United States get in this war? 17. Guys, we were drugged, kept kicking and screaming into this war. Okay, we didn't want any part of it. You remember the assassination of the France Duke, France Ferdinand, right? Um, you remember the Lusitania? It was a U.S. Uh, cruise ship going across the Atlantic sunk by the Germans with over 200 Americans on it. Okay? They had supplies for the British in the hull of the ship, so the Germans sunk killing all these Americans. We didn't go to war. Okay? It was really the Zimmerman telegram near the end where the Germans tried to get Mexico to go to war against us and that they would back up Mexico. But, you know, when you look at causes of World War I, which we'll talk about, you know, militarism, imperialism, nationalism, okay? Um competing against the British for dominance. The Germans were ready to do that. Okay. So, as I'll tell you guys, um, three million Americans will go overseas. About two million of them will see combat for about a hundred and maybe 200 days. I have to look at my notes, but it's 200 days. Who won the war? We did. Now these other European countries fought each other for four years, right? We fought for 200 days. We went. Okay, the Yanks. The Yanks came marching in. We're going over there. There was a song. Over there, over there. Da, 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 da. When the Yanks go marching in. You know, that sort of thing, okay? And so they called them doughboys. The Americans were doughboys. We had planes and ships. And guys, we were bringing, you know, three million men across the Atlantic. It was incredible. Our economy had to go from a peacetime economy to a wartime economy, and we did that. We had a small standing army. Guys, in 1914, when the war broke out, the United States had the sixth largest army in the world. Maybe, no, 17. Behind number 16, Romania. So we had to rearm. Now we had the largest navy in the world. Okay. Our founders have always known, dating back, especially to like 1803, that the United States and two ocean nations surrounded by oceans, would always need a strong navy. Okay? And so we worked on that. Back in the Spanish-American War, they called it the Great White Fleet. They painted the ships white. I wasn't very smart. <laughs> they don't paint them white anymore. Okay? So we had a great navy but a very small army, but World War I showed us we could mobilize for war quickly. Kind of like with the ventilators, with the COVID thing, everybody was worried about patients going on ventilators, so what did we do? We had Ford Motor Company making ventilators, just like Ford Motor Company was making tanks in World War I and World War II. Okay? President Trump used the National Defense Authorization to force companies to make ventilators. Now we realize we really don't need that many. <laughs> We've got a surplus, people. Okay? And the good thing is we're able to share those with other countries that may not have ventilators. Okay? I think they were making them, Boeing was making them to spirit from what I hear okay all right so this is the war to end all wars the great war okay now I had my grandfather 
Charles Carroll E. Bright went to Europe and fought. My namesake. Harry Truman fought. General Patton. So we go a while. We go a while here. World War II. What year did that start? Nineteen thirty-nine, September first or third, however you think. Uh, Nineteen thirty-nine. When did the United States join? Forty-one. December eighth, nineteen forty-one. Right. So again, we didn't want to go over there. Now, guys, this is going to be a pretty big bulk of what we study between the wars. Okay, there's a ton of lessons to be learned about how we acted after World War I that helped lead to World War II. And we're like, hey, after World War II, let's not do that again. Okay, so those are really important lessons that we, we have to learn, okay, between the wars. All right, so the U.S. goes in the day after Pearl Harbor. Now, we declare war on Japan. Germany actually declares war on us three days later. We didn't declare war on Germany yet. Okay, but through the Axis powers, Italy, Germany, and Japan of World War II, the Axis powers, we will be at war, and obviously we will end that war on August 8th, or the 6th and the 9th, we will drop the two atomic bombs. Okay, and then by September 1st, the Japanese had officially surrendered. Okay. So we'll learn all about that. Okay. So coming out of this, we are in a nuclear age. Well, first an atomic. We don't have nuclear weapons until 1952. Okay. And the Russians will have nuclear weapons in 1953, one year later. How'd they come up with that so fast? How'd the Russians get, the Soviets get that so fast? After we developed it. Spies. The Rosenbergs. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Okay, and her brother, who stole those secrets and gave them to the Soviets. I'm not a nuclear scientist, but I've met one. <laughs> I used to have a student whose dad is an actual nuclear scientist, worked for the government dismantling nuclear weapons. He was a professor at Newman. Okay. And he said it is so incredibly hard to build a nuclear weapon. This is a fusion bomb. Okay. Atomic bombs where you're splitting, the fission bomb, is much easier. I mean, North Korea did it. But the hydrogen bomb, yes. Without spies, you know. Okay, so next war, Korea. This is where we move into the age of containment. Containing what? The Red Menace. Communism. Okay? Guys, coming out of World War II, the Soviets got troops into North Korea. The Americans had troops into South Korea. Eventually, both countries left. But the Soviets left behind a well-trained communist army. The Americans didn't want to see a war there, so we didn't leave a bunch of weapons for the South Koreans. And guess what? On June 25th, 1950, the North Korean communists came storming across the 38th parallel that was dividing the two countries. Now, we still had troops in Japan because we were occupying Japan after the war. Okay? Who was in charge of that operation? General Douglas MacArthur. Okay? And he sent troops into Korea, and we started fighting. 
Most of the fighting takes place in the first eight months. But eventually, guys, the Chinese communists are going to get involved. And it's going to make it a lot worse. Because we were winning that war, big time. And then you throw four, <clears throat> four million Chinese in the mountains of North Korea. Not all at once, but eventually. Okay, We settled on the 38th parallel almost three years to the month, okay, July of 1953. So my father, Raymond Arthur Ebright, graduated high school in 1948, 49, and he went to the Ohio State University and was on the freshman football team at Ohio State. He was a 150 pound center. They didn't grow him like they did, like we do today, okay? And he didn't do very good in school and he kind of tweaked his knee and so he dropped out and joined the Marines. And they told him he was gonna be a pilot. And so he learned to fly with the Navy and he was a Marine pilot in the Korean War. Basically, he flew a C-47, which is a transport plane from a base in Japan into Korea, bringing in supplies and flying out body bags of dead Americans. We're gonna lose about 50,000 Americans here, okay? 400,000 here in World War II, okay? About 50,000 here. Stop the spread of communism in the south of Korea. Those people in South Korea today are free because of the sacrifices of 17 UN countries, but mostly the US troops and their own South Korean troops, okay? Because France, you know, they sent like 1,200. We had 302,000 Americans there. Okay. Luxembourg sent 44 troops. We sent 300,000. This is the new world order coming out of World War II. You have two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. They're enemies. So while we're in a cold war, sometimes it turns hot. And it did in Korea, and it will again in Vietnam. Now, the dates for the Vietnam War are ethnocentric here. These are dates for the United States, not for the Vietnamese. The Vietnamese were at this much longer than these dates. It's more like a 30 years war for them. So coming out of World War II, there were communists that wanted to take over. See, the French controlled this, Vietnam. It was called French Indochina. It was a colony, right? And so when the World War II was over, the French wanted to take back that colony. Well, there were people in Vietnam that did not want the French to come back, and some of those people were communists. So based on our policy of containing communists, we went there to stop the spread. First, we tried to help the French hold on to their colonies, and then the French were fighting the communists and they got their asses kicked, and so they fled, because that's what the French do. Okay. And then it became an American war, alongside with our Vietnamese friends. Okay, and it was our longest war in American history, until the Afghan war. Okay. Very controversial war to this day for many different reasons. Okay, and I'll get we'll talk about all that. Okay, um, there's some really good documentaries on this, guys. I mean, you can educate yourself on Vietnam. There's so much out there to, to view, to read. You know what I mean? Um, 
So you can watch movies, you can watch documentaries, read books, okay? It's 1975. Now we're gonna go a long time, guys, before we have another war. And this is where we're gonna take a left turn tomorrow. And that's the Gulf War, 1990 to 1991. Now I was alive when Vietnam was going on, but I don't remember it. I was in college when this one happened. And I do remember, okay? I was in my girlfriend's living room with her parents. I was in college and Hostilities broke out. I mean, we had been prepping for this. To set, we sent hundreds of thousands of troops over to the Middle East before the fighting started. Because the fighting in the Gulf War actually lasted 100 hours, and it was over. <laughs> okay, so the buildup took months. The fighting lasted 100 hours. And I'm sitting on that couch, and there's only one cable news network at the time. It was called the Cable News Network, CNN. And CNN has cameras, journalists, in the middle of Baghdad, Iraq, on top of the building that's a hotel. See, by 1990, guys, we have what are called smart weapons. We can launch a cruise missile from 1,200 miles away and hit something within a meter. So the journalists all knew they were safe on the top of the hotel because they knew the military wouldn't take out the hotel. We were trying to take out Saddam Hussein's palaces and his military, you know, his missiles and all that. So you can see it, it's at night and you can just see all the anti-aircraft fire. See, they're shooting at our planes, trying to shoot our bombers down, but they can't see them because they're stealth. The stealth fighter and the stealth bomber, the radar can't pick it up. So there's firing into the air and it's like the 4th of July, man. Okay, and we're watching this on our television in color in the safety of our living room. It was kind of weird, okay? Now, when Vietnam was going on, guys, they were piping that into people's living rooms at, with the news, you know? And you saw a lot of dead Americans. It became a war of attrition. This lasted 100 hours. Now, guys, this is where we are going to pick up the road to 9-11. Because it is during this war that the United States, who had been friendly with many Middle Eastern countries, and many Middle Eastern people will become the enemy of a group called Al-Qaeda, okay? And so tomorrow, I pick up with that, and we just got a couple more wars to go, all right? But we pick up with that, how we became the enemy and what transpired, and we'll give you a, 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 an overview of terrorism against the United States. Sound like a plan? Sorry for the technical difficulties, guys. I'll get it fixed. See you guys tomorrow.